Welcome everyone. I'm Christy Norris. I'm the director of Carolina K-12 at UNC Chapel Hill and my wonderful colleague Paul Benici is behind the scenes. He's there if you have any technical issues as you're all logging in and getting settled for our evening together. So let me say up front, thank you so much for being here. We know you are suffering as teachers from severe Zoom fatigue, um, but here you are during your free time in the evening because you are amazing rock star teachers. So we know that you are facing incredibly hard challenges um, always, but especially now. We just want to say we appreciate you, we value you, and maybe most importantly, you are doing such a good job. If you have not heard that today, if you have not heard that um, in the past weeks, you are knocking it out of the park. You're doing a great job. So just in addition for being here, thank you so much for your service in the classroom. Tonight's program for teachers is uh, part of a month long series on Ida B. Wells in honor of Ida B. Wells hosted by um, and in support from the Center for the Study of the American South and other university partners, as well as the incredible Orange County Remembrance Coalition. And I just wanna say a word about the coalition, which is a community organization operating in Orange County, North Carolina in coordination with the Equal Justice Initiative but their goal is to recognize the victims and survivors of racial terror lynching, including Manly McCauley, who was a young black man lynched in Orange County after eloping with a white woman in October of 1898. And the coalition has been doing such important work by hosting events and community conversations and really shining a light on the often hidden history of racial terror lynching and other issues of injustice, um, past and present. And so if you were unable to attend the October 8th session of this IWL series, which was on the history of racial terror and lynching, make sure you check that out. I'll include the link to it and all of the other programs in the series and a robust, very robust list of follow-up resources that we'll be sending out to you after participating tonight. But we really do appreciate the work of the coalition and encourage all of you really, if you're tuning in from counties that don't have something like that, um, use them as a model because they're really just doing sensational work. Very quickly, our mission at Carolina K-12 is to serve our state's hardworking teachers with free high quality resources and programs. And you can learn more about our upcoming programs on our website. And we do provide CEUs for your participation in our virtual programs, which you can also learn more about on our website. And we have a really extensive database of lesson plans and resources that we hope that you'll check out and find useful. In tonight's session, uh, I, along with two amazing panelists, will be sharing some insights and ideas regarding teaching about hard history in general and Ida B. Wells and the history of racial terror lynching in specific. Um, most of what we cover tonight has been specifically based on your questions, on those, um, the things that you said were challenges of yours when you registered. And as well, we will be taking your questions in the Q&A box that you'll see if you hover at the border of your screen. Um, just know that all participants tonight will stay muted um, with your cameras off. But if you have a question, that Q&A box is a direct line to the panelists. Um, you won't see the questions that you send. It only comes to us unless we answer in writing. So you know, just know that at that point, it would be visible to everyone if we respond in writing. To frame tonight's conversation, I really wanna elevate the wise words of the phenomenal Polly Murray, who said, it has taken me a lifetime to discover that true emancipation lies in the acceptance of the whole past in deriving strength from all my roots and facing up to the degradation as well as the dignity of my ancestors. I love those words and they should really ring true for all of us because she's so right. Collectively, we have to face our past, even the hardest of histories because the legacies and repercussions of our history is still with us and we have to face it to fix it, to grow and live up to the promise of what America can be. 
But like Polly Murray also said, while facing the hard history, we need to also do it by acknowledging the power of people, the strength, the resilience, the accomplishments in the face of incredible adversity. Because if we only tell the hard parts of history, we're really doing as much of a disservice we, as we are if we ignore it altogether. Because throughout every period of history, every period, Black folks and people of color have fought back and demanded justice, both on their own and also at times via interracial movements. And our students need to know those stories of fortitude and resistance as well. They need to understand the realities of lynching, but they likewise need to know about the amazing Ida B. Wells, who at great risk to her own safety, defied all odds, and went after the perpetrators and the bystanders of racial terror lynching. As a Black woman in the late 1800s and early 1900s, she spoke out and stood up and was a brilliant champion for justice in a time when she could have easily been lynched herself. Our young folks have to know about her and they need to know about others like her. And they also need to know that resistance didn't always take such a public stage as such what Ida B. Wells took. You know, it also took place in more subtle ways and everyday acts of defiance and resistance against a very entrenched system of white supremacy. And I think Ida B. Wells was just spot on when she said, the way to right wrongs is to turn the light of truth upon them not to keep it out of our history textbooks or to ignore it ever happened in the curriculum, but to shine or rather teach, teach with the light of truth. I would argue it's one of the most patriotic things that you can do to bravely face the truth in order to grow and to be better. So my hope uh, in this small bit of time that we have together tonight is that you will learn something, that you'll start to consider the various ways you can integrate topics of hard history as well as resistance into your classrooms. And ultimately that you'll leave committed or even more committed than you already are to furthering your knowledge and pedagogy with the understanding that this work is a marathon and not a sprint. And Carolina K-12 is here to support you every step of the way. We know this work is difficult, it's challenging, it's even, um, it feels risky in today's climate, but we also know this work is critical to the survival of our democracy. So again, we'll be sending out a massive list of resources in the next few days to you, including lesson plans, vetted readings, primary sources, all to help you teach about Ida B. Wells, in her life's work, including about um, the way she resisted the gross injustices of lynching. Before we go any further, I wanna make sure you fully understand the incredible story of the woman whom we've been honoring this month. So I wanna just play a quick five minute video for you guys about Ida B. Wells, just to make sure we're all uh, on the same page and grounded in the same history moving forward tonight. Um, and, and just remind us of all she accomplished. And so after this five minute video, I'll highlight a few quick resources that are already ready to go for you to teach about Ida B. Wells and racial terror lynching in general. And then I'm gonna invite our two other panelists on to start delving into how to do this work in the classroom. So here's an overview of the incredible, amazing Ida B. Wells. There's something irresistible about underdog stories where remarkable people rise from humble beginnings to do incredible things against all the odds. But few stories are as dramatic as that of Ida B. Wells, a woman who was born a slave in Mississippi in the midst of the Civil War and became a daring investigative reporter and a civil rights crusader, who would one day be called the loudest and most persistent voice for truth in an era of injustice. From an early age, Wells carried exceptional burdens with exceptional courage. She became the head of her household at the age of 16 when both her parents died suddenly from yellow fever. In order to support her five brothers and sisters, she curtailed her education and started working as a school teacher in rural Mississippi. When she was 21 years old, Wells boarded a train to Memphis and seated herself in the first class ladies car, only to be told that black women were restricted to second class. Not only did she bite the conductor who tried to remove her, she soon filed a discrimination lawsuit against the railroad company. She won the initial case and while it was overturned on appeal, an article she wrote about the experience helped launch her career as a journalist. 
Wells' life changed forever in 1892 when her friend Thomas Moss was murdered by a white mob in Memphis along with two other black men. Their brutal killings inspired Wells to speak out against the horrors of lynching, an increasingly common tool of terror used against black people in the decades after the Civil War. Black men were often falsely accused of rape in order to justify their murders. But in a series of widely read articles and pamphlets, Wells argued that lynching had little to do with protecting the honor of women and everything to do with protecting the power of Southern white men. Like so many civil rights leaders who would follow in her footsteps, including the civil rights leaders of today, her criticisms were powerful because they took aim not just at the misdeeds of individuals, but at the unexamined institutions of racism and power behind them. Her groundbreaking analysis changed the national conversation around lynching, and even her future mentor, Frederick Douglass, called his writing on the subject feeble in comparison. Wells was the co-owner and editor of a black newspaper in Memphis. After one of her anti-lynching articles displeased the white community, an angry mob stormed the office of the paper and destroyed it. Faced with death threats, Wells started carrying a pistol in her purse, but refused to back down from her anti-lynching campaign. She said it was better to die fighting against injustice than to die like a dog or a rat in a trap. After that, she relocated to New York, where she began to publish investigative journalism for an even larger audience, including pamphlets that collected statistical documentation of lynching in the South. Her popular anti-lynching speeches eventually took her to Britain, where white audiences seemed far more outraged than many of their American counterparts. Her overseas speaking tour inspired international condemnation of lynching, particularly from British newspapers and politicians, and elevated Wells to the most visible national leader in the anti-lynching movement. Although Wells often criticized herself for being stubborn and hot-tempered, those same qualities made her a fiery orator and a relentless crusader against injustice. Faced with death threats from Southern whites and criticism from moderate black reformers who considered her too radical, Wells refused to compromise her ideals for the sake of comfort, convenience, or even personal safety. The way to right wrongs is to turn the light of truth upon them, wrote Wells, who never failed to speak unpleasant truths even when it cost her friends or potential allies. Although surrounded by hostility and threats from people who wanted to punish her outspokenness because of her race and her gender, she refused to be silenced. Although she fought for women's rights, Wells was often disappointed by white suffragists who considered racial issues a distraction from the fight against sexism. Some even endorsed segregation. During the famous women's suffrage parade of 1913, when black women were told to walk at the back, Wells simply waited till the march started and defiantly joined her state's delegation. Similarly, she was frustrated by those in the black community who saw women's rights as unimportant to the fight against racism. Caught between the struggles of her race and her gender, Wells often felt like she fought alone. Although she had many suitors and withstood enormous social pressure to marry, Wells remained single throughout her 20s. In her early 30s, she finally met her match in Ferdinand Barnett, a black lawyer who was equally passionate about social justice and a man who wholeheartedly supported her career. They married and had four children together, and while Wells would eventually step down from her full-time position as a newspaper editor, she continued her work as a reformer until the day she died. When she passed away in 1931 at the age of 69, Ida B. Wells had profoundly changed the way people looked at race, gender, and violence in America, and transformed herself from a slave who was regarded as property to someone once described as a woman who walked as if she owned the world. Told you she's amazing. Um, and we do also understand that some historical topics, especially given how connected they are to today, can be really tricky to navigate in the classroom. And so Carolina K-12 has a lot of recommendations for you in terms of how to do this work safely and effectively. And we'll be including in our list of follow-up resources, uh, a guide, tips and tricks for teaching hard history and controversial current events that you can follow um, because you have to do a lot of preparation to do this work effectively. I think it's, um, what's the quote? Failing to prepare is preparing to fail. So a few of those recommendations that we'll touch on tonight include um, that you have to cover a comprehensive narrative and constantly ask yourself whose stories are being elevated, whose stories are invisible, missing, secondary, and why. So if you're teaching World War II, but not about the lynching of black veterans, why? And likewise, if you're teaching about lynching, are you making sure you're also teaching about all of the ways folks like Ida B. Wells and others pushed back and spoke out? And tied to this recommendation is 
integrating diverse primary sources. We have the evidence of so much of our history in primary sources, and I know I'm preaching to the choir and teachers already know this, but find those compelling primary sources. And again, the follow-up resources we're going to be sending will have some curated primary sources for you. And I'll also provide an example of what this looks like in just a moment. Well, that said, I do want to offer one word of caution regarding primary sources and uh, the sources that you use specifically since part of our subject matter is that of lynching. Really suggest you consult the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum's guidelines for teaching about the Holocaust when teaching about racial terror lynching. So for instance, I do not believe in using horrific imagery, no kind of simulations um, in this work since that can really have a counter effect. And you'll see those um, same guidelines and more in the USHMM's guidelines. So check those out. And like I've said, if you take anything away from tonight, teach resistance, teach about survivors rather than victims, educate to empower. I always refer to the wise words of Dr. Hassan Jeffries, who wrote the preference to the Southern Poverty Law Center's Teaching Hard History of American Slavery Report, in which he said, history is not exclusively a story of despair. Hard history is not hopeless history. And of course, as you all know, it's also not just history. Our history is cyclical. It's a continuum. It is with us today, and we have to make those direct connections in the classroom. And so the last thing I want to share before I turn the program over to our next presenter is to put your mind at ease uh, by showing you a few quick resources that are ready to go for you to teach about Ida B. Wells and racial terror lynching. Um, everything you need is, is there in these documents. Beyond the tips and tricks um, that I mentioned and beyond our conversation tonight, we've developed specific all-inclusive lesson plans for you guys to use to help guide you in this work. So first, Carolina K-12 has a comprehensive lesson called Ida B. Wells in the Light of Truth, and it utilizes a rotating stations activity to incorporate readings, um, excerpts from a documentary about Wells called A Passion for Justice and, and more. And the point is really to highlight all of the incredible aspects of the career of Ida B. Wells from her fight against segregation to her crusade against lynching, her role in the women's suffrage movement and just so much more. Uh, the lesson is in Carolina K-12's database and it will be linked in the follow-up resources. Again, our database is filled with all kinds of lessons on all kinds of topics related to the long civil rights movement, which we certainly consider Wells to have been a part of. And the last resource I'll highlight is the website A Red Record, named after and in honor of Ida B. Wells and the brave work that she did in shining a light on lynchings. If you attended that October 8th session on racial terror lynching, you heard a bit about this site, but it's basically a digital map of identified lynchings thus far known to have occurred across the state of North Carolina. And those dots you see are color coded by decade when the lynching occurred. And you can drill down to your own county and I'm gonna do Orange County since I opened by talking about Manly Macaulay. And so when you hover above the points, you can see a snapshot of information about the individual who was murdered via lynching. And by clicking on one of those points representing each person, you can then pull up primary sources, specifically news articles from the time describing the events. You won't find images here, which is one of the many reasons I think this site is a good teaching tool to use with eighth graders and up. So what you're looking at right now are a few of the news articles reporting on the lynching of Manly Macaulay, who, as I mentioned, was a young black man hung at the age of 18 because he eloped with a white woman in October of 1898. Now that date might resonate with all of you history teachers joining us. Carolina K-12 has done several programs recently on the events of the 1898 Wilmington Massacre and coup. And this is related uh, to the Macaulay lynching and that the affair was used as propaganda to convince white men all around the state to vote in favor of white supremacy that November, 1898. The Wilmington massacre actually occurred the very same day that Mr. Macaulay's body was taken down from the dogwood tree from which it hung. 
So the last thing I want to show you is um, that you'll find four detailed and comprehensive lesson plans on how to use the Red Record site, as well as teach about racial terror lynching in your eighth and twelfth grade, eighth to twelfth grade courses. These plans cover not only the history, but also, as I've said, we believe it to be so important um, that we elevate the resistance to lynching, which is the subject of one of these lessons, as well as the legacies that remain to this day, which you'll see there in the list is another topic of a lesson. Our students have to learn this history, but in a way that makes them feel um, not defeated or shameful. We need them to feel empowered. So that's really our goal with this curriculum. So I see some great questions coming in through the Q&A already, and I'm going to promise we'll circle back to those after our next two presentations, because I want to now invite Ms. Corey Greer Banks to join us on screen. Um, Corey is an amazing teacher. teacher. She, she, I say, she like teaches, teaches, um, and she teaches everything that I just talked to you about and more. And she's here to share some of what she does with you. And you wouldn't know it, but Corey has been a teacher for almost 20 years and is in her fourth year at the Explorer School in Raleigh, North Carolina. Again, if you watch that October 8th program, you actually heard about some of her students who were involved in that project, a student-led project documenting the Wake County lynching that they've been researching. So I'm going to turn it over to the amazing superstar teacher, Miss Corey Greer Banks. Corey, thank you so much for being here and go ahead and dive into your 15-minute presentation. Thank you, Christy, for inviting me out here. Um, for trusting me to talk to other teachers. I feel like, I don't feel nervous because I feel like I'm with my people, I'm with fellow teachers and Ida B. Wells um, was a teacher. So I feel like, hey, I just wish that we were all in the same room um, talking together, but we have to be safe. So I'm glad that we are keeping our distance and still bringing forth the light of Ida B. Wells um, virtually. I, um, as Christy said, I've been teaching about 20 years. Uh, I got my start teaching in Germany and made my way down here to Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, I am here as you guys are, have probably been teaching all day in Zoom or in some type of hybrid class in the state of North Carolina, um, but I wanted to be here anyway. One, if you are, um, asked to present on Ida B. Wells, you don't say no. Nobody says no to Ida B. Wells, all right? And we know that even from the video that we just watched. Um, I'm not gonna be able to cover everything. We have 15 minutes together, but if you have any more questions, I am happy to reach out to you. I reach out to many folks. You can reach me at corey at explorers.org. Nice, short, and sweet. All right, so. Favorite quote, favorite, favorite quote. It was um, stated in the video that the way to right wrongs is to turn the light of truth upon them. And I feel like that is so true even for um, teachers. This is our, our duty. This is our path as classroom teachers. We are bringing up the next generation. Um, so it was not hard for me to pick out this quote um, since she is such an awesome and wonderful writer. Um, so Coming back to this, it really kind of reminds me of why I do what I do, why I chose the profession that I chose. It is our duty as teachers to shed a light on history, um, to, to put a light on past wrongs and to shine truth as Ida has done. Um, so five things I am going to tell you, I'm just gonna to admit to you that I did in the classroom um, that Ida would never do. All right, so I'm going to tell you throughout my 20 years things that I did in the classroom that perhaps I shouldn't have done and lessons that I've learned in teaching about um, lynching, racial terror, um, violence, um, and, and, and Black leaders in general. I'm not going to bombard you with a whole lot of content and text because you've been working today and you don't need to read that. Um, I'm going to share real pitfalls that I've had. I'm not going to um, place it on another teacher. I'm not going to try to fake and present myself as this amazing teacher right off the bat. Um, 20 years have been 20 years of victories and mistakes. And so I'm letting you know right off the bat that I'm not Ida. Um, I'm still learning and I learn best with other people. And you're going to see that uh, as I'm talking. 
All right, so the first thing that I have learned, one of the mistakes that I made early on in my career is I did not pause and confirm that kids even understood the meaning of lynching. I remember, and I'm gonna share with you, um, one year I was teaching um, To Kill a Mockingbird and I went all in and I was enthusiastic about it. And I was, you know, just 100%, like just thought I was on course and my kids were getting it. And like midway in the book, we were halfway in the book, a child raised their hand and asked what was the meaning of lynching? And I just died. That was early on in my career. And from that, that was a lesson I learned that I need to pause and make sure that we have a shared understanding, especially in the classroom of what lynching even means. Um, if we leave it up to kids to just Google, you will find that there are like so many different definitions of the word lynch. And so, you know, some kids have it in their head is simply to be hung. Um, some people have it, uh, you know, just all forms of uh, murder. Uh, some have it as limited to a time period. And so you wanna make sure that um, what you're teaching, that you guys have the shared understanding before you go into it. So you want to have a little language study and I make sure that I do that before I go into any literature, um, any um, type of historical uh, lessons regarding lynching and racial terror. Um, the next thing I learned is um, I taught, and it shames me to admit this as a black teacher, but I taught the history of lynching solely um, as black oppression. And um, it would wait, it would weigh down on me. I would go home and I'd be like, oh, I have to do this again tomorrow. I have to um, hurt myself time and time again and show um, black people as victims. Um, all the time. And then I started to wonder, why am I doing this uh, to myself? And so I started reframing my teaching of lynching, not as just uh, Black people as victims, Black people as oppressed, Black people as downtrodden, Black people waiting for um, white people to come save them. But uh, first, I reframed it as that lynching was a tool to maintain white supremacy. Uh, that's how I restructured all of my curriculum is the history of white power, the history of white supremacy. And so um, if you come into my classroom, I start all the way at the beginning with Christopher Columbus and the new world and how labor was changed um, to be based upon skin color um, as an economic tool and how that tool and that power needed to be maintained. Um, because I think that um, we need to study the history of whiteness uh, just as much as uh, lynching or oppression of black people. Um, but we need to kind of, kids need to put together, how did this, this, this concept of whiteness come into play? Uh, there's a great podcast uh, out of Duke University called Seeing White, which um, was illuminating to me um, that kind of broke down the history of whiteness. And I feel like we need to put more of that into the classroom so that kids understand not only the idea of um, blackness and black power, but how did white supremacy come to be in the first place? Um, another lesson that I had to learn is I had to move out of February. I found myself, you know, a young teacher, you want to make sure that you do all of the right things and you don't break any of the rules and that you hit all of the standards. And so February was the month to teach black things. And so I flooded all of February with black things and um, including uh, anything having to do with lynching or uh, oppression, slavery. Uh, I think some of my first students, and I apologize to them ahead of time, <laughs> probably thought that Harriet Tubman, Martin Luther King, Ida B. Wells all existed, you know, and, and made everything great for Black people because I felt like I needed to fit it all in that month. Um, I apologize to those students. They can come back and see that I have gotten much better since then. Uh, you really need to, from the beginning of the year, make sure that your um, curriculum is anti-racist from the beginning. Is your curriculum focusing on one race, one, um, one specific group of people? 
if you find that you have to put in groups of people in months, in certain months, then perhaps your uh, curriculum is not as anti-racist as you thought. So I really had to kind of start from the beginning. That's not to say that I don't still celebrate February. February is, you know, Black, Black celebration, just celebrate all of my Black heroes and sheroes. Um, but I use this month now to celebrate and to like just uplift what I have already put forth in my curriculum. Um, so I don't feel pressure to fit everything in. I feel comfortable that my curriculum is anti-racist from the beginning. Um, I take Ida out of the box. So just like, you know, taking all of the black things out of February and putting it in my curriculum, uh, I took Ida B. Wells out of the category of just a black leader and put her where she rightfully should be placed. She was a muckraker and people like kind of like skirt over that. Like during that time period, you know, you had Jacob Reese, you had Ida Tarbell, you had Upton Sinclair, you had all of these people that during that time period get most of the airtime um, during what we popularly known as the progressive era. Um, I like how in Christie's video, um, I, Ida B. Wells went and put herself in the front of the suffrage movement when they were, you know, marching down and parading. That's what we have to do in the classroom. You, we have to put um, Ida B. Wells back in the front um, when we're talking about muckrakers and we're talking about the progressive movement. She talked about things that leaders in the country of that time period did not want to be talked about, just like muckrakers of that day did, just like they, you know, just like um, authors were talking about meatpacking. Um, industry and child labor and um, hours, working hours. Ida B. Wells talked about, you know, lynching in Southern states and Southern counties and people did not want that to be talked about. So she needs to be forefront and center when we're talking about muckrakers. Um, and last, um, I did not do a good job in making connections. And so I feel like that is, the most important one. Um, you can keep this all in like a history book and kids are going to ask why, the why. Um, why is this relevant to me? Um, and so really, really work hard to make Ida B. Wells relevant to young people today. Um, with that, you know, Christy brought up a red record and I love this site and I, I often come back to it. Explore School often comes back to this after we've discussed um, people like Ida B. Wells or the 1898 Wilmington Massacre um, or lynching in general. Um, this is a great way to uh, talk about how we remember uh, people. And I love that, you know, each one of these dots, behind each one of these dots is a story. And it's a story for your students to discover. And it's a story for your students to perhaps write about. And if you live in one of these counties or you live near one of these um, dots where there was a recorded lynching, it's an opportunity for you and your students to get out and um, pay and, and, and remember and, and give memory back to some of these victims. And uh, at Explorers, uh, I'm happy that we have took part in, you know, the only recorded uh, lynching in Wake County um, through a red record. And uh, we worked with uh, Matt Chaldon, who was, uh, who is a teacher at Middle Creek High School, and uh, Raleigh Charter and a Nightdale High School, and uncovered the lynching of George Taylor, who lived in Roseville and was accused of raping a white woman and was lynched by a mob. Um, in 1918. Um, these students, Explorer students and high school students in a joint effort uh, uncovered that, researched that, and actually uh, spoke with Wake County leaders, spoke with in a town hall in Roseville, traveled down to the Equal Justice uh, Initiative and, and spreading awareness. They were really empowered. They were working hard to make a difference. And that is my son right there. He uh, was a student, he has since graduated, but he 
was a student in Matt Chaldone's class at Middle Creek High School. And he was part of the group that went to speak before school board leaders and Wake County leaders. And um, he still talks about that class. He's 19 years old and still talks about that was the only class that he um, wanted to stay awake for. That was the only, that, that class ignited him. Um, and, and so I, I encourage you, if you are teaching about lynching, you're teaching about Ida B. Wells, um, have your students, they're ready. They want to be muckrakers. Um, over here, we have uh, Explore Students. And so this was a joint collaborative initiative between um, Raleigh schools that uh, my son is very proud of. And I'm sure that all the, all the students that were involved were very proud of. Um, in other ways, this is an opportunity to interview local investigative journalists. I mean, um, Black women journalists have not gone anywhere. Ida B. Wells paved the way, and there are lots of um, investigative journalists of color to, uh, to, that, that are eager for your students to reach out to. Um, one right here with uh, Independent Weekly, Courtney, Courtney Napier, um, she recently um, wrote a, a great article about the challenges to affordable housing in Raleigh. And I put her up here because I'm a little biased. She is an Explorers grad. Uh, but, you know, these people are front and center and they're doing the work every day. And they are often facing danger. They're in there on the streets protesting. Um, their families are in danger. You know, when we talk about Ida B. Wells, she was a mom, she was a wife, she was a teacher, and she faced dangers um, in putting all of this stuff in the forefront. And so do investigative journalists today in 2020, every single day. Um, there was uh, something that, uh, you know, that Ida B. Wells said about, you know, the people must know before they can act. And there's no educator to compare with the press. The press, you know, is out there and there are still, still issues out here that um, kids are passionate about. I know teachers are worried about parents saying that we're indoctrinating um, children with uh, certain ideologies. I, after I teach about lynching or uh, racial terrorism or white supremacy or Ida B. Wells or anything um, concerning this subject matter, sometimes I sit back and I let the kids come up with their own um, topics. How are they gonna connect this to 2020? And it never fails, they always do. They always, when you think that they are not gonna make those connections, they make it and then, you know, if if somebody comes with questions, you say the students have been empowered with this. The students are passionate about this. I have not pushed this on the students. And so if you arm them with the information, um, they can act. Uh, students can't do anything if, they, if the knowledge is not there. So put it there and, and they, will, they will go forth and act. All right, thank you. Corey, thank you. You, I could feel like all the teachers that are with us, even though we can't see them, I can see their names and there are some amazing. I, I could see them. <laughs> but they were like, yes, yes, amen, yes. Like I could feel them through the interweb supporting everything that you were saying. And I just have to say, there are so many things that you said that struck me. But one in particular is I really love this notion of kind of flipping your curriculum and coming at um, this as an as a concept of systemic white, um, you know, white supremacy, because if you think about it, a lot of folks are afraid to go there in the classroom. But if you think about what white supremacy is, to not teach about white supremacy is to actually be teaching a white supremacist curriculum. And that might sound a little extreme, but if you deny it, then in fact, you're kind of promoting it. Right. Well, we already teach a white supremacist curriculum. We just haven't named it. And That's so right. I just think it's really important to name what it is that we all currently teach. Yeah. And you did such a, that's another thing that you said that stood out to me is having that shared understanding of language and having that common language. You know, I hate to use the word vocabulary because it gives me like nightmares of elementary school foldables and foldables. Oh, yeah. 
Right. Uh, but it is about having that common language. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to say that I just love about what you just did is that you framed that in your mistakes and you are brilliant and amazing. But I think that's so important for all of us to understand as teachers, we need to give ourselves some grace. And so we're all going to make mistakes, right? We're all going to mess up, but when you know better, you do better. Yeah. And so I love that you, you know, apologize to your students. If you make a mistake, you know, kind of go back over your intention and have those conversations. Um, but, you know, obviously you come at teaching with a growth mindset. And I think for some of us, that's a really hard thing to do. So it is. And it's constant daily reflection, like, mm -hmm. okay, how could I do? And this is not like reflection as in, you know, administrator reflection as send me all of your reflections of your lesson plans. No, this is just at the end of the day, you're like, hmm, how could I do that better? Or why, why don't I feel empowered when I'm teaching um, this curriculum? And I had to ask myself this question, why would I go home and feel like crying sometimes after teaching mm -hmm. such oppressive curriculum? And I found like one reframing this, like, let's admit this, this is the history of white supremacy. Let's just call it what it is. And um, really putting forth like throughout all of American history, there were black leaders, right. there was black hope throughout every, every single moment of American history, mm -hmm. there were black leaders fighting against white supremacy. Right, despite unimaginable challenges, right? Yes. I mean, it's really just incredible. And I love that your students are getting that. And I hope everybody will leave here tonight if they're not already. And, you know, again, to teachers, if you haven't been doing that, it's okay when you oh. know better, you do better. We're always learning, right? Start off a little bit at a time. Don't like get off of this webinar and say, oh my gosh, I have to like redo all of my curriculum tonight. Like, lesson plan's gone. <laughs> no. A little bit at a time. Give That's yourself right. those. baby steps. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. I'm going to let you take a break and get some water. And then I'm going to call you back after Brian, where you've got a ton of questions coming in that we'll chat about. So take a little break. You're amazing. Um, and I know that Brian, I can see Brian, even though his camera isn't on yet. Brian, you can come on. I can see him over there saying like, man, she did such a good job. I know Brian, that's totally how he is, but. Yeah, I, um, uh, I, I'll, I'll, I see my time to Corey um, I it much <laughs> better and much more eloquently than, than myself. So you are too. So um, Dr. Brian Gibbs is here with us. He specializes in critical teaching, critical teacher education, and K-12 social studies education. Um, he is coming to us from the UNC Chapel Hill School of Education. Um, what's amazing about Brian, though, is he is legit, because after studying secondary social studies education and history at Miami University in Oxford, he student taught in the Navajo Nation for six months, living with formerly incarcerated youth. He went on to teach social studies for 16 years in East Los Angeles, California, eventually teaching in the graduate schools of education at UCLA, USC, Claremont, and Antioch. And this dual experience as both a classroom teacher and a teacher educator drove his interest in research and making research count for educators in the field. He has a PhD in curriculum and instruction with a focus on social studies, education, and critical theory with a minor in education policy studies. Dr. Brian Gibbs, it's so wonderful to have you here. Thank you very much. Um, I always appreciate an introduction by Christy Norris because it is kind and fabulous and lovely. And uh, I'm not quite sure if my mother is here, but she would love to tune in to hear you introduce me. So maybe sometime we can, uh, we can arrange that. Thank you so very much. Um, just in, in case anyone's interested, I'm also six foot three and I'm a Pisces. That's also very important <clears throat> information to know about me um, that, that Christy didn't include. Um, what I'm going to share with you is um, uh, some information that I gathered from a research study, which I've been conducting the last two years. Um, the research study, and we'll talk more specifically about the research study later, I think, but I, I wanted to well it down to some um, sort of general pillars and some general ideas of what was being revealed in the conversations I was having with teachers throughout the state of North Carolina and students around uh, the teaching of lynching specifically and racial violence more generally. Um, the, the study began 
uh, two years ago, looking specifically at how lynching was taught. What I was interested in was how lynching was taught in schools near historic lynching sites. And so I used Dr. Koch and Dr. Gaddis's uh, The Red Record Map um, as a way to seek out and recruit participants um, because I was interested in how the space and the history of the space um, of historic lynchings impacted the way in which uh, teachers went about teaching and the ways in which the community reacted and the ways in which the students um, experienced that teaching. And that's where this knowledge and information comes from um, that I'm going to share. I, I want to share a quick story, which is one of the very first teachers I spoke to as I was working on recruiting for this um, project. Um, I asked him, if he taught lynching. And he looked at me and smiled and he said, you mean the third rail of social studies teaching? He's like, I mean, that's got everything. It's got, it's got, uh, as Corey and Christy had raised earlier, it's got um, sex, it's got uh, accusations of rape, it's got uh, extrajudicial police violence, it's got community complicity, and it's got murder. And he said, it's got everything that you're not supposed to teach or everything that they warn you off from teaching. And so I waited a beat and I looked at him and I said, so do you teach it? And he was like, of course, how can you fully understand the black freedom struggle, the black freedom movement? How can you fully understand the history of the American South? How can you fully understand our present current system um, and the experiences of, uh, of communities of color um, in uh, response to police violence and other acts of violence without understanding the history of lynching? And so that is just to acknowledge the complexity and difficulty of all this. And so, some of the things I learned um, from these last two years exploring these topics are, um, one, you have to have taught racial violence before you get to racial violence. And what I mean by that is that if you want to teach about racial violence and you want to teach about lynching and you want to teach about former fo present, um, present uh, types of racial violence, you need to intentionally begin thinking about that from day one. You need to build it in. And so what I mean by that is you need to begin to build a community. The teachers who taught this successfully had a strong and connected classroom community. That didn't mean that they all agreed and that didn't mean that they were all the same, but what it meant was that the teacher knew the students and the students knew the teachers. And so what that meant was long before they got to teaching about lynching or teaching about racial violence, they knew the kids that had Confederate flags hanging at home. They knew the kids who had experienced violence themselves. They knew the kids um, that came from different backgrounds that were gonna react differently to the ways that they were gonna go about doing this work. And so teaching racial violence is not something you do early. It is something that you build up to um, once students are ready, once you are ready, when you have the knowledge, and when you have the information. And so it, it can't be the first time that students learn about racism, anti-racism. They can't learn about discrimination. They can't learn about these things when they, they need to have thought through and thought about the definitions, the ideas, and the concepts prior to them getting into and looking at the history. There needs to be a preparation time period um, that goes through that. And the teachers who really successfully from, from this research, the students who really, the teachers, pardon me, who really successfully taught this intentionally built up to it and were moving towards it and got to it when they felt that they were ready. The second thing about this, which is really difficult, is it's hard to talk about this. And what I mean that it's hard to talk about is all of the teachers that were involved in the study all went about this in different ways. And they went about it because they were different people. Um, they were ethnically different. Um, they were male, female. They were trans. They were gender non-binary. They, they were all different kinds of who they were within the classroom space mattered about the approach that they took. It also mattered in terms of where were they? Are they in an urban space? Are they in a rural space? Are they in a suburban space? Um, are they teaching an all black uh, school community? Are they teaching a multi-ethnic school community? Are they teaching an all white school community? Um, that all impacted the way that they went about engaging in this work, the way that they went about um, thinking through and thinking about this, the way that they went about building relationships, gaining knowledge, um, and understanding who they were. And so one of the things that we, we really need to think about as we engage in this work is we need to do an excavation of ourself. Who are we? How are we seen? How are we interpreted? How are our motives going to be interpreted? How are we going to move forward with this work without inflicting what Stephanie Jones and other folks call curriculum violence? This notion of um, a good faith error which causes damage to children. Um, and so we got to think through and think about the ways that we go about this. And that's why I really appreciate Christy connecting 
everyone to um, the Holocaust Memorial's website with their guidelines, because those are really thoughtful guidelines. And as Corey said, they can cause us to reflect and think through and think about the way that we're going to go forward with this work. I don't think that the reflection should be paralyzed. And I think that's a really important part um, of this. Um, we need to be thoughtful about how we're going about it and understand how we're seen within the community and how we're seen within the school and classroom space um, and build these relationships and build the knowledge um, before we are ready to go about doing this work. I think what also becomes really important is that we frame um, this work really well. And I think, uh, and what I mean by framing is we think through and think about what is the content we are presenting to students? What primary sources are we using? What secondary sources are we using? How are we framing the narrative? Um, what are the questions we're asking students about this? I think the questions we're asking students to think through and think about in terms of this work can become really important. So for instance, one, I, I think it's a good faith mistake that I see some, teachers make, particularly younger teachers, will be around the teaching of slavery, for example. The question they'll ask is, should we have slavery, right? That's their guiding essential question for the unit. And my push is always like, no, like that's not a question you ask because we already know that, no. We've known it for a long time, the answer is no. Um, uh, and what that does is that raises the possibility that someone can make an argument that we should have slavery. So the same is true about racial violence. What is the question we're asking students to pursue? What are the ways in which we're framing this? How are we going about having a conversation about that? Because one of the things that we really need to be thoughtful and concerned about is thinking through and thinking about how different, how different students are experiencing this teaching and learning within our classroom space. We wanna make sure that we build up um, a way especially in multi-ethnic spaces, to protect students of color as they're wrestling through this very complicated and very difficult and very damaging history. And so we have to be really thoughtful about how we're framing this. Um, I think that even goes back to the notion that, that Corey raised and that Christy raised too around how are we defining particular things? Um, so for instance, when we, think about, when we think about lynchings historically, it often involves um, violence using a noose. But one of the things that we know is when we move out west, the violence um, in terms of how we define lynchings became much different um, over time. Um, when we think about what happened to Mr. George Floyd, um, when Mr. George Floyd was murdered, that was, that was labeled and uh, identified as a lynching by many folks. Um, but Nicole, um, but Nicole, I can't think of her last name, Nicole, I, I'm how embarrassing, Nicole, um, Nicole Hannah-Jones, sorry, Nicole Hannah-Jones, recently pushed back on that and saying that she calls lynchings lynchings and she calls different forms of violence which re, which uh, which uh, you know uh, result in murders of, uh, of black men and other folks of color as something different than lynchings and so we have to really be thoughtful about how we're framing these things in the dialogue um, that we have about them I think one of the things and this is to reiterate some other things that, that both Corey and Christy raised that becomes really important is that we balance these notions of horror and hope I think that that's one of the, when I work with a lot of with teachers, be they pre-service or in-service, I talk about this notion of the horror and hope and we need to walk a balance between those. Um, I think when we think about the work of Bettina Love and uh, her push for an abolitionist education, one of the things that she's arguing about is truth and authenticity in the teaching of racial violence. But I think what becomes really important, as Christy said in the beginning, is that we do not stop there. Um, what, what we need to do is we need to have an honest and authentic horror examination and an honest, authentic examination of the hope and trying to think through and think about that, not false hope, not incorrect hope. Um, one of the things I found is that the teachers that were involved in teaching lynching, lynching uh, incredibly well um, did things similar to what uh, Matt Sheldon and Corey did um, and Melanie Winters and other folks that, um, Shannon Hardy and other folks that were involved in that work is that they dug deep into the local history that they serve as names of people who were resistors back in the 1880s and 1890s, who are these unsung heroes um, that are not known, that they reached for and found. Because one of the things that we know certainly in all of this is that there was resistance always and it continues to be. And so it's important if we can to not only talk about Ida B. Wells Barnett, who was an amazing human being, um, but also talk about people that are less well known, who are closer to home and connect that directly to current and present activists. To have this notion of not just understanding that there's activism that can be done, but what does it look like? How can we do it? This notion of helping students understand that they were born with agency 
And part of what we need to do within our classroom spaces and in our schools is help them learn how to sharpen it, help them learn how to understand it, help them learn how to recognize it, and help them learn how to use it to create change and advocate for themselves and others throughout that change. And so this is this whole notion of thinking through and thinking about how do we balance these things. We can't just leave students in the horror. It can't just be shock and awe. And we can't develop something around false hope. You know, well, maybe someday, or we need to get really specific about what that looks like historically, what it looks like within the present. The teachers that did this really well made really strong connections between past and present. They made really strong connections between the violence. They made sure that students understood, as Corey and Christy were talking about, that this violence is part of the system and it's systemic, it's not individual. There are individual actors, but we can't just say that individual actors did bad things. This was an intentional creation of a system that we need to think through and think about why that's happening. And one of the things that comes from that, which I saw in students is an affirmation, where students understood that's why these things are happening, that there's a reason behind it, that there isn't a randomness to individual acts of violence, that is part of the systemic nature. And a recognition of that um, can be part of liberation, can be liberating and can be understanding and can be part of healing. And I think that's one of the real complicated parts of this is thinking through and thinking about the ways in which recognition of violence, understanding of violence, balance with this notion of hope, balance with this notion of agency, and looking at movements like Black Lives Matter and other, and other organizations and movements, and looking at the historic actors that, that worked on resistance and all the way through, can lead to a sense of healing even in these very complicated things. Um, Jeff Duncan Andrade has written about the notion that understanding um, the collective story and the truth behind the collective story is also a recognition of society and in towns and in organizations and in ethnicities resistance over time and resilience and refusal to quit and refusal to um, to stop. And I think at that point I'll, I'll stop um, for my time and bring Christy back in um, and uh, and continue our conversation. Thank you, Brian. Corey, you can go ahead and come back on too. So, so much of um, what you were saying, Brian, really resonated with me. A lot of the questions that we got when folks were registering, especially, um, you know, we had a teacher say, I want to do this. I'm honestly scared to do this, to teach about these types of topics. I'm not sure the best method to do it. Carmen noted being worried about the lack of training that teachers have had in this area. She's at an administrative level. Um, Tanisha, who's an amazing teacher, hi Tisha, Tanisha, uh, talked about the importance of creating the learning space to address these subjects where all students feel safe to engage and empowered after the lesson. And so that's kind of all brilliantly referring to preparation, which is what you are saying, that building of a community getting those relationships, being aware of the skin that you're in and what your standing is in the community. Um, I think sometimes as teachers, we just want to jump into the curriculum on day one and we forget we have to build that foundation, especially if you want to teach this type of work and in this way. And so, you know, just to pick up on that a little bit more, um, you know, we have several teachers talking about, you know, a teacher from Orange County is asking, how do we best prepare our students? Um, and other teachers asking, what about the students and families? And you mentioned this, Brian, a lot of what you talked about, I think gets at this. How, you know, what about the, the black students, the students of color? Um, I worry about their trauma. Some of them have families who have lived this history and we all now, you know, the more we learn about personal trauma and PTSD, how that can manifest through generations. Um, you know, so a lot of our teachers are really worried about, you know, teaching do no harm. Um, so do you guys have any thoughts on what you do kind of on the ground to prepare? Are there particular sources you go to, particular strategies? You know, one thing you definitely want to do to build relationships, understanding it's going to be different for every classroom. What are some of those key points of preparation, would you say? Yeah. I know in my classroom, we start actually in the summer. Um, we start communicating to parents that our curriculum is centered around American history. You know, kids are coming in from seventh grade, coming out of a world history class into eighth grade, um, into an American history class, which they haven't had since fifth grade. Um, and 
fifth grade American history is very different from the topics we discuss in eighth grade American history. And we bring the parents in. Um, we actually have parents of color who, um, you know, who once we talk about some of the things that we're gonna address in the classroom in the summer, we've had parents that have come in and have talked about uh, their memories of Pullen Park being segregated. Um, and so, um, I always say invite the parents in, invite the parents in to talk about their memories as a child. Uh, we have grandmothers that have come in and talked about how they um, were, did not learn how to swim and how this was something that was common for black folks of that time period. Uh, so I always say embrace the parents beforehand. Don't wait until there's a problem. Oh, they're mad at the door. <laughs> yeah, um, it, it, let them know ahead of time. Also, we we start our curriculum in the summer. Our summer read books um, center around um, topics uh, uh, around Black history. Uh, we offer these, like we have five books that kids can choose from, and two of them include uh, books about uh, Black issues, such as The Hate You Give and All American Boys. And so we start with the students who want to read this. Yeah. And so I feel like if you start with students, like students are really passionate and they're hungry to know this and they kind of know like, hey, you're not telling us something. That's right. There are people out here protesting. There is a group called Black Lives Matter and we come into a classroom and you're sanitizing everything for us. Um, so students are coming in here with questions. And so we feel like at Explorers, if we start with the summer reading and these kids are voluntarily choosing these books and then when they come in, they have to um, prepare a video, a book review video that they show to the entire um, grade and talking about what they liked about that book. We're starting with the student's passion. Start with the students. That relevance piece too mm -hmm. is so key. Yeah. And we'll also send everybody that's um, watching I mentioned that kind of substantial document that's all about tips and tricks. And uh, we also have an activity section of our database that's all, act, you know, literally activities on building a foundation. You likely will need to train your students on how to have a civil conversation. Because again, going back to that idea of vocabulary, a whisper might mean something different to me than it does to you. And it certainly will between you and your students. So even those small little things, um, you know, kind of, you really just have to train kids on how to be in this space, in this community space um, before you can, you know, I remember when I taught history, I don't think I even touched curriculum um, deeply for the first week or so, because the beginning was really all about getting to know one another. And I find that when you do that and build those relationships early, you actually have more time to teach throughout the year because you're spending less time managing behavior issues or outbursts and things like that. Brian, anything else that you would add in on um, the preparation piece? Yeah, part of what I would say too is if, if you are, because part of what I interpreted from that, from the questions are that it's a multi-ethnic classroom space, right? So so being uh, worrying about about black children like with, within this, right? Particularly if there is a smaller number um, within the classroom space. And, and I think part of that is you have direct conversations with them. You know, like you pull them in before school or after school or lunch or some other time and have direct conversations about, you know, what we're going to be doing and, and, and how they think about that and, and what they think about that. And maybe as Corey was saying, reach out to their parents and family, but have conversations with them and monitor them. I, uh, not monitor them in an oppressive like panopticon way, but, you know, watch to see how they're reacting emotionally to what's happening here. Yeah. I think that um, students, whatever ethnic backgrounds um, they have react emotionally to this in different ways. And some of it's easy to see and some of it's less easy to see, but I think we need to be thoughtful about that. Um, one of the things that the research surface, which, which is kind of getting to this, is that um, all the teachers indicated that they assume racial trauma in all students. They assume that every student that comes into their, into their school has been a victim of a perpetrator or a witness to some form of racial trauma, be it through television and media, be it through personal experience, be it through historic you know, family relations that they've all experienced that. And so what they argued is that then you need to teach with a trauma-informed pedagogy, which means that you're watching, monitoring, thinking, talking to, coming up with assignments where students can reflect and share what they're experiencing and thinking about, and that you're gathering that data 
on a regular basis and shifting and changing the way in which you go about the work that you're doing. Um, I, I think that with that, though, I think part of this is that you need to, the teachers need to, um, you know, have like, you know, have some things figured out before they get to thinking and teaching about racial violence. And what I mean by that is like, like just what you said, Chrissy, how do we have, how do we have discussion? How do we, how do we listen to each other? How do we share? What are the things that we don't say? You know, like a really fantastic principal who just retired, um, good for her, sad for the rest of us, is that she talked about how well, you can say whatever you want at home, but in this school and in this classroom, these are the things that we do not say, and these are the ways that we do not act. And so I think really framing really firmly and specifically about what, we're, what this is a conversation about and what this is not a conversation about and the kinds of comments that we're going to wrestle through and the kinds of comments that we're not going to. I think there's a difference between an openness and a written assignment where students wrestling through you know, their belief or connection to white supremacy rather than something which they can bring up which can be helpful to students of color within that space. Um, and so I, I think that becomes, that becomes one of the really important parts of this. And I think part of it, you know, again, trying to dig back, because part of this, I think what becomes really important about this is that, that a lot of the teachers that engaged in this engaged in what they called radical honesty. And what they meant by that was particularly the white teachers talked about the times in their life when they participated in acts of racism, you know, that they talked about either subtly or more specifically. And, and teachers of color talked about the times in which they experienced it and what they did and didn't. And that became part of Again, not in the beginning, but that became part of sort of the truth process of when they got into racial violence, that they were ready to do some, you know, it wasn't anything particularly formal. It was these things which came out as they were engaged in conversation or analyzing documents or looking at evidence, and they were looking through and thinking about these things um, that became really important. And so I think building up to that. Yeah. Um, and um, I think you said too, I think, um, the reflection is so important. And I don't know about you, Corey, but I know, or either of you, but I think as teachers, it's often the piece we sometimes rush through or run out of time and don't get to. And it's really the most important. So even, you know, small strategies, I know teachers will use, you know, maybe a reflective journal or an exit ticket, some type of way to check in with all of your students. So, you know, and letting them know, you might, you know, you're going to experience some emotions with this. And when you feel these emotions, come and talk to me, right? Like you don't want students going home, um, taking it home and taking it to mom or dad who then come busting into the school. You know, you want to keep that line of communication open. And I think you're right. One of the great ways to do that is to make sure that you're doing reflections. One of the things that I love to use, and I use it not just when we're talking about sensitive topics like this, but I use it just in general in my curriculum so the kids know and they trust is I use polleverywhere.com, mm -hmm. um, Kahoot, and Google Forms. And so I make a variety of these kind of like uh, what we would normally consider as journal entries, mm -hmm. but I create surveys, one where the whole class can kind of get a read through a pie chart or through a bar graph what the class is thinking regarding a particular topic, especially sensitive topics. But I also include, uh, is there anything that you want me to know? Is there anything that you want to tell me as a, a second survey question? And, and the kids by this time have built up a relationship, trust is, um, is established. And I can go through, you know, in this technological time, I can scroll through and kind of get a read on, I need to talk to that student. Oh, I need to connect with that student. That's that student is feeling a particular way about a lesson. Um, all of those have free um, accounts, free resources and make it quick and easy. Um, so we don't have to be the teachers of um, the eighties and nineties car carrying around stacks of composition notebooks. It's all right there in our-, um, in our, in our yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so kind of on the flip side of that, related to that, we have several teachers, um, you know, we've got teachers from all over North Carolina. Um, we have a teacher asking, what are some best practices for teaching students in a mostly white rural community about racism and white supremacy? So we have a, a teacher saying, you know, I know that I have students whose parents have a Confederate flag in their yard. Brian, you talked about this. And I think it's so true that you know, unfortunately, there's no magic wand or paintbrush, you know, this is going to look different in every single classroom, 
frankly, in the same school, you know, different periods can look very different based on the makeup of your class. But, you know, we have teachers saying, how do I do this work with in this community with students and families like this? Scott's asking, how hard do I push in a public school setting? You know, I want to challenge my students, but I also don't want to alienate anybody. I don't want to push shame and blame or create a sense of white fragility. Um, Catherine says the public, my public isn't always open to hearing that injustice continues. So do you guys have any thoughts about what you do? You know, we're here, all of us are kind of in the triangle in Chapel Hill and Raleigh. If somebody's out in Jackson County, this work might look, and I love Jackson County, that's not to pick on them, but you know, if you're out somewhere rural, this, or even 15 minutes from here, this work can look very different. Um, what are your thoughts on if you are in that kind of climate? Do you not do this work then? I think it's more important to do it. Mm. I, 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 that is just kind of my, like, I can't even give you a polished teachery, <laughs> Carolina Public Humanities, nice, yeah, nice. We like it. That's why we love you. <laughs> if you're in a mostly white community, you're, you, and you have families that have Confederate flags in their front yard, you have to um, assume that they're not being exposed to diverse voices. And I know Brian probably has some specific tips on this, but to me, that makes it even more important to expose them to diverse voices because they um, probably have a, a very set um, fixed mindset on, mm. on, on what other voices, what that looks like. Yeah, it's interesting. Lee um, just said in the chat box, too many white kids aren't necessarily given an opportunity to see the yeah. racism of their upbringing and that they can feel very chat trapped by it and very sh ashamed of it too. So Brian, what do you think? Yeah. No, it's, yeah, no, I, I just, just to echo, I, I agree with Corey that I think it's, it's even more necessary. I, I think what's interesting is that a lot of the teachers um, that I researched that engage in this work in those communities do it more subtly. And, and so what I, what I mean by that is they don't necessarily talk about, they don't, uh, they don't necessarily identify it as justice work or democratic education. They engage in conversations with students and they, they, they teach about race and racism. It's just really interesting. They, they teach about race and racism as if it's, the, the average kind of usual thing. And I think that they've been surprised by the student's willingness to think through and think about that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I do think that one of the things we need to maybe get a better sense of is kind of a, like our timing and a clock. And what I mean by that is, I think that, um, I think particularly when I work with pre-service teachers, they're, they're kind of been raised on TV, movies of teachers and, and movies of teachers where it's like they surface racism and then suddenly all the kids are changed when I think that it's much more of a slow process. You know, I think it's much more of a, of a more subtle change, typically, particularly for, particularly for students that are, that are, you know, it sounds like that they're embedded within a system, that they don't see anything else, um, that they're being raised and told a particular thing. And I, and I think just to reiterate that, it's important for us to disrupt and interrupt that. And I mm -hmm. think that that can come from, um, you know, just, you know for, so I think part of it is, and what I mean by the kind of the more indirect route is like, I think sometimes, like one of the readings that I like to use often, even to talk about lynching, is the short story Passing by Langston Hughes yeah. or the short story Cora Unashamed, which yeah. both of them never directly talk about lynching, but talk about the threat of racial violence, which is embedded within that. And, and students of all types and, and all, you know, if you gauge them in Socratic, one of the reasons why I like Socratic seminars is sort of rule-based. It's, it's a guided way in which to engage in analysis of what's in the text, as opposed to sort of bringing in like outside opinions and views. And so it's engaging in the dialogue about what's being presented here. And those texts allow for teachers to get at issues of pressure in racial violence and help them get a better understanding, I think, than necessarily like a primary source oftentimes or, or uh, even a secondary historical source because they are written within a much more beautiful, eloquent way and get at it more subtly that can lead to some really powerful and really strong conversation. I, I think that, um, I think that, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that, I, I think that discussion can be a way. I, I think it's interesting because when you think about like a mono ethnic space, I think there are opportunities for more risk taking because there's less likely to damage a, a child of color who might be within that space. Mm. So I think it's important to, to push forward with the interruption and disruption, but I, but I think it can also be, um, 
uh, like like the direct challenges can be like, let's look at some statistics. Like, let's look at how many lynchings there were and let's look at the numbers. Oh my God, there were really that, that amount of numbers. Yeah, let, let's look into how she came up with this number. Let's look at the way in which she reported it. Let's look at, um, and so I think again, how do we frame this? What's the question? And I yeah. think what becomes important is that as you're building up to this, that you get at, that you know, like your student, yeah, you, again, just not to reiterate, but you get to know your students. I, I think one of the important things too is knowing when you're not ready to teach something. Yeah. And I, I, what I'm not saying is you don't, don't not teach it. Sorry, my double negatives there. My, Ms. Brock, my English teacher is rolling over. She's alive. So she's it's not rolling over a grade. She's <laughs> a, feeling my, my bad language somewhere. But, um, but I mean, I, I think about when I, I was, I, I led a professional development um, over the summer, um, right before the school year was about to begin, right when Silent Sam came down um, here on campus, the, the Silent Sam, the racist uh, Confederate soldier statue. And I was asking the teachers, are you going to teach it? And a lot of them said, like, when you open, are you going to teach it? And they all said, no. And, and it was really interesting because they said, I'm not ready yet. I don't have all the information. I don't have the community. Am I going to teach it in two or three weeks? Yes. You know, but they weren't going to do it like in day one of the first week. And so I think it becomes important to think through and think about when are they ready and when are you ready yeah. and as, as a teacher? And I think that's particularly true when I think about teaching present violence. Like there were a lot of teachers, like when, uh, when Ahmed Aubrey and George Floyd um, and Breonna Taylor were murdered, they were not ready to engage in a lesson about that. And so what they did instead is they spent the first five or 10 minutes to connect, negotiate the spin. And what I mean by that is, what do we know? What happened? Like, what do we know? Mm. And what we know for sure is that this is what happened. And this is, there are this number of officers and he was accused of doing this thing and he died, right? And then like, so, so I think, so they, and, and they kept talking, the teachers kept talking about, we're going to get to this later, right. but not yet. But for right now, I can't let silence fill the space. And so I'm going to talk about what happens and we're going to get ready to teach it or learn more about it down the road a bit. And yeah. I think that, um, and, I, and I think that, uh, I think that's, I think it's important to not, not teach lynching or racial violence, but I think it's also important to know when you're not ready yet. Yeah. And I, and I think that, um, that that becomes important. Yeah. yeah. The pacing is really important. Corey. I, I think as a social studies teacher, bring it back to the primary documents. Um, you know, if you're in a rural county, you go to a red record, you go to that website and there are uh, most likely lynchings that have occurred within your county or very close to it. Yeah. Um, go back to those records and delve in, have your students delve in mm -hmm. as to why those things occurred. Um, have your students kind of like wrestle with hard, uncomfortable questions about why their communities are one um, ethnicity or another. Yeah. Why are things um, still segregated in 2020 where we live right now today? Like have that come in as a hard unanswered question and have your students kind of wrestle with that, kind of chew around mm -hmm. with it. Um, just this week, my eighth graders, um, we had a lesson on um, how should Thomas Jefferson be remembered? <laughs> and, um, you know, I went through, we, we talked about, you know, his presidency, the Declaration of Independence, and then we got into this, the notes on the state of Virginia and, um, you know, and, and then we got a little bit into Sally Hemings and, you know, some of my students were like, no way, you know, there are some reports that say that, you know, those children were Thomas Jefferson's brother's kids and it could not possibly be Thomas Jefferson. And so we went to the primary documents we, and we went to, Mon we took a virtual field trip to Monticello, to the Monticello website and, you know, pulled out um, documents uh, related to Thomas Jefferson from that time period mm -hmm. and let the, let the students draw their own conclusions, mm -hmm. but they're there. And so as a history teacher, I say, pull out those primary documents and let them wrestle with it. Yeah. And the other thing you guys are getting at that Angela said, you know, there's this importance of letting white students know up front, particularly white students who are reluctant to embrace discomfort um, to really kind of let them know you're going to feel discomfort, but this is what's happening. This is why you are feeling this way. Embrace that, lean into that discomfort. Um, if you feel yourself getting angry, ask yourself why, and let's, let's work through that. Let's push through that and let them know that up front. 
Um, also, Ebene said, and I think she's amazing teacher herself. She could be leading this uh, workshop herself, but the arts, um, and we really do push that vetted art, you know, literature, um, you know, Mike Wiley Productions does incredible one-man shows about a lot of the topics we're talking about. So using art as a window to also build that empathy can be really powerful, maybe in a community if you can't go to the primary source documents, if that's a little too close, weaving in some art. Um, having those texts, I think, can really be helpful too. Um, and the other thing, and this is one of the recommendations in our guide, is depending on where you are before you do this work, you might want to develop some type of school-based committee where you have folks from the community, um, you know, professors like the amazing Dr. Gibbs, a parent, a student, an administrator, you know, create kind of a, a teaching hard history curriculum committee or a history curriculum committee and have some community support there, you know, a member from the NAACP so that if something, you know, if a challenge comes or, you know, if, if you have a team basically to back you up and to help you navigate this. In some communities, it might even be your local pastor. Um, you know, I think don't feel like this is all on you as a teacher. Try to build a little coalition, even if it's a tiny little coalition to help you in this work. I think that can also be powerful. That helps so much. At Explorus, we teach as co-teachers, we teach as two. And so in the classroom all the time is myself, a history teacher, and my colleague, Jesse, who is the language arts teacher. So when we go forth, this is our humanities class. We go yeah. forth together. And, you know, our administration has given us just full, like, just don't surprise us. Just let us know what you're doing. And <laughs> they have, yeah, they just want to know ahead of time. And they, yeah. they we know that we have their support 100%. And so I would advise, don't go into it blindly, make sure you have support with you. Yeah, that's definitely amazing. So I wanna share my screen here really quick to talk about this next um, issue because it is coming up so, 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 so often. I would say it's probably what we're getting the most of. And, um, you know, I know that Brian, we talk a lot about this, but in Corey, you mentioned this, we, in every event we have done like this, including this one, and these are all comments from this registration, the number of teachers who are feeling worried of doing this work, you can see here, I worry about being accused of giving my students liberal ideas. Um, hard history equals partisanship where I teach. I feel that students, parents, and others will see me as radical or left. Um, how do you discuss indefensible acts without students, um, without putting your own political bent on it? You know, it's just, it's one after the other. And this is just a small collection. As a white teacher, I worry students and parents of color will misunderstand or assume I shouldn't be talking about race. As a black man, I've been accused by white parents as having an agenda when I teach about these topics. What do you say to teachers? Because, you know, in today's political climate, especially, this is over and over and over again that teachers are feeling this way. So um, I'd kind of like to spend the, the rest of our time really diving into this. What are your thoughts? Um, I, I, I really resonate with, you know, as a, as a black man, I've been accused by white parents as having an agenda because I have received um, emails this year <laughs> Um, from parents that are, you know, that accuse me of indoctrinating their, their students, that I have an agenda um, because of the summer reading books that we offer, that we've offered for several years now. Um, so I feel all of that. And I've often like stopped and considered like I could make my job easier and just teach the standard <laughs> academic, you know, kind of the white supremacist the white um, history that kind of like that will not ruffle any feathers. And I know I will be going backwards um, and I know I will be doing my students a disservice. Right. Um, often too, like one thing I, I have thought about, especially this year in this tense environment that we are in is as some of those same parents, their students are on social media, um, putting forth all of these messages that at the end of the day, I'm not sure they know what they mean or they know kind of the history of some of the stuff they're putting on um, TikTok or Snapchat. And um, 
it's ironic that some of those same students from those parents who have accused me of indoctrinating their children, those children and I are forming these close bonds and these children are asking me questions. Mm. Um, and so like, don't, don't deny those, those kids either. Like, I think somebody said in the chat, it, some of these, these kids have been denied diverse voices. And so you have the opportunity to potentially be like a valuable resource um, right. to those students. Right. Brian, I want you to weigh on in on this because I've heard you talk about this and I just wanted to share, I'm going to link this article in your resources. I wanted to share this um, article basically saying that we really as teachers need to think about this call for neutrality and understand that that call is itself a, a political stance. Neutrality is itself a political choice and one that bolsters the status quo. What results is a classroom that potentially ignores the fears, interests, and concerns of many students. So Dr. Dunn at Michigan State talks about how the strict adherence to neutrality, avoiding political topic, topics is basically a tactic that marginalizes. And so she's not talking about, you know, saying teachers should be telling their kids how to vote. She's saying that, you know, this call for neutrality, that you should, you should avoid discussion of controversial issues. Don't talk about racism or inequity or climate change or gun violence um, because you'll be partisan or political. And she argues that if you look at it, education at its core is inherently political from the textbooks to the curriculum, everything is political and ideologically informed. And so both what is taught and how it is taught is shaped by the culture, the social, the political, the historical, and we can't pretend that teachers should leave those contexts at the door. So I really wanna say to all of you, all of you who are feeling that push, push back because um, neutrality in the way that it's being thrown at us is itself kind of a, a biased notion, I would say. What do you think, Brian? Yeah, no, 100%. I, Dr. Hadley Dunn's good people. I, uh, she, she does really <laughs> fantastic work. So I, I really appreciate you, you know, leveling up uh, her work here. 100%, uh, schools are inherently political. Um, they are inherently political spaces. Um, they are uh, 100%. And so we need to we need to assume and lean into the political nature of that. I think that we need to, I mean, we need to assume static too. I, I think I think one of the things that we need to be able to do is we need to, to explain why and what we're doing and how come. Like why we did, why did we arrive at this? We all have fancy degrees from universities and we are experts and professionals and we need to be prepared to answer questions. And if we can't answer the question then we need to reach out to, you know, somebody, me, Corey, Chrissy, Paul, you know, someone else that you know, they can help you think through and talk about how you're going to articulate this. Right. Just as when I go in for a surgery, I ask the doctor, why are we doing the surgery? When I had the will drawn up for my daughter, my wife and I said, why are we doing it this way? Teachers should be able to articulate and explain why they're doing what they're doing. And I think that's part of what we need to prepare teachers for is to get into an argument, not a fight, not a screaming match, but they can explain, articulate, and defend what they're doing. It's based in pedagogy and curriculum and research. And it's not about indoctrination. It's about pushing your kids to really own their point of view, because I don't think that they thought about it in 15 years or 18 years or 13 years. Right. And so I think it becomes, I, I think it's incredibly important to do it. I think it feels uncomfortable. I think that you feel, you can feel attacked, but I think that you 100% need to, um, be able to articulate why and how come you're doing what you're doing. A teacher that I'm working with in a uh, very rural northeastern North Carolina um, got, uh, got you know, a principal reached out because she was teaching what the principal assumed were controversial things. And this first year teacher was able to articulate why and how come and where it was going and where it came from and what the theory was. And the principal was like, okay, I'll talk to the parents. Mm -hmm. so, so, I, so I think that um, I think that we need to we need to assume that it's politics and lean into it and uh, be able to articulate that we are, that students can think that the way, the way they get an A in my class is not by thinking the way I do, but by responding to all of the pushes and questions and counter arguments that they're going to um, connect with. Yeah, I think there's so many great comments and questions. Lee said, we've lost sight of the fact that political is not the same as partisan. And I think that that's very true. Um, and I just have to share this, right? Um, 
Patrick has shared, I think that if you build that sense of community where the students can really feel the love in your teaching, they'll open up regardless of the culture of their home. I teach in a rural county. I'm an African-American male. And I've had a student, a white male, who actually divulged to me that he and his father were in the Klan. His exact words to me were, I'm in the Klan, but I like you because you're cool and you treat everyone the same. And so I think that's um, that goes back to those relationships that you guys have been talking about. That goes to um, you know having that space where students feel like there's no shame, there's no blame, they can open up. And I think if you have that space, these these calls of indoctrination and bias might be a little fewer and further between. Although in today's world, maybe not. I don't know. Um, but it does so much does go back to those relationships. I think. And on that note, the other thing I just wanted to share a little bit of um, is Chris Edmonds from Teachers College, his concept of reality pedagogy, which um, really is kind of teachers that, oh, I'll check you out. <laughs> it's about teachers thinking about um, rather than managing behavior and students, you know, this kind of mentality of pound of flesh, you know, you're not going to get over on me really trying to see your students as co-teachers. And I think in this work, especially, I think it's kind of what Corey was getting at, what, what she was talking about too, creating that space for dialogue, you know, that's again, community sense can be really, really powerful. And I, I love this article. And again, it's in the list I'm gonna share with you because he talks about teaching in New York City after 9-11. And rather than go down and sit and listen, let his Muslim students kind of talk about how they were feeling. He had a large population of Muslim students in New York, um, giving them space to heal from the targeting that they were experiencing. He just went on with his curriculum. And he says, if I'd started the dialogue, I would have learned a lot about them and how I could have been a better teacher. So let your students teach you too. And I know for a lot of us as teachers, that makes us feel a little um, seasick almost. But I think that can be really powerful to the concept of reality pedagogy and co-teaching. Can, can I add one thing? So, so one of the things I would say too is that um, one of the things I always do with my students is I always give them, like my university students, I always give them a survey to fill out and I ask them what their political ideology is, knowing that all my courses are going to be critical and social justice in nature. And the majority of my students um, identify themselves as moderately conservative or conservative. But mm -hmm. what I found in my courses is I've had very few of them ever resist the notions of critical race theory or social justice teaching or, 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 or critical work. And so I, and I think part of what Emden gets at here is Emden gets at the notion of that we often sometimes as teachers assume certain things about our students. And mm -hmm. so one of the things, he's a science educator specifically. And so we talked about how he gave all of his, uh, he gave, he was working with middle school kids and he gave all these middle school kids like little cheapo throwaway cameras. And he wanted them to video, he wanted them to film and take photographs of their neighborhood. And he was assuming that he was, they were going to bring back like, uh, you know, rusty, 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 like, uh, iron gates and they're going to talk about oxidation and he said that they're going to bring back splintered windows and like they're going to talk about the way in which wood rots but he said what they brought back were like um sunsets over the projects and they brought back like older brothers and younger sisters holding hands and walking to school like this whole different beauty and sense of self and i think that becomes really important when we think about the communities in which we teach are we sure about the speculation that we're making or the, are we sure about the how, how we think students are going to react to certain things I think can hang us up. And I think that there's ways to get at that where we build a relationship, we attempt to connect with them individually um, before we um, get at it. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, we are at time again, as always with you two, I could keep talking all night, um, but I know folks probably want to eat and drink and be merry, but Dr. Brian Gibbs, thank you so much. You are ever so amazing. Corey Gerbanks, you, mwah, you're just brilliant. And um, thank goodness we have folks like you in the classroom. I appreciate both of you so much. And I love the fact that every time I come to both of you for an event for teachers, you're both like, okay, I'm in. So I know you both. This is my thing. Yes. yes, yes. And thank goodness. Um, so thank you both. The last thing I just want to um, kind of end with here is also just some, some words about, again, why to do this work. Um, and I think this quote from Brian Stevenson is really powerful, who says, our history has scarred us, it has bruised us, and it has injured us. 
But when we tell the truth about our history, we can change things. We can get to something that feels more like freedom. We can achieve something that looks more like justice. We can shift this narrative that has burdened us and resurrect the hope that animates many of us. That is the power of a history teacher or an English language arts teacher who integrates history. This is the power of teaching. And yes, it can be risky, hard, draining work, but we really hope that you guys, you're already doing it, but we hope that you'll keep doing it. Reach out to us if you need us. We know we've only spent an hour and a half together and that is, you know, but a tiny bit of time. Um, again, this is a marathon and not a sprint, but we're gonna load you up with resources. I am sure Brian and Corey would be happy to hear from any of you. Um, I know I certainly would. And so we just thank you all for being with us tonight. And most importantly for, again, your service in the classroom, because I really do think in some ways, um, the future of our democracy depends on you, not to put that on you, but um, you know, it really does. So the last thing I also just wanna share with you is that we have another program coming up on November 10th. I wish we could have gotten to Charles's question. His question was um, quickly, what's the one story you think is left out of history classrooms that must be told or conveyed or taught? And I'm cheating because I'm gonna say, this is one right here, Robert Williams. Um, so join us for this on November 10th. He is, um, it's just incredible history. So we hope that you guys will come back again. Um, Brian, Corey, any last quick final thing? You wanna answer Charles's question really quick? Yeah, yeah. I, would, I would say the, the Tulsa massacre. Yes, in the Wilmington 1898 coup too. Oh yes, yep. oh, yes. Um, if you haven't put the 1898 coup into your curriculum, that's something you can easily do. Uh, Carolina K through 12 has resources for that. And you could do that. Like if the November 10th is coming up. So yeah, that's right. Yeah. Great. And then we also have an event in December, the beautiful children's book, My North Carolina A to Z, which is a gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous younger elementary pre-K book um, about North Carolina's rich black history and heritage and culture. We're going to be doing that event and 100 teachers are going to get a free copy of that book so join us for that all right again brian corey thank you all you amazing teachers i see your names i know so many of you and you are rock stars we appreciate you be in touch have a great night stay safe vote and vote go vote <laughs> bye everybody bye thanks bye